want to share just a personal story, if I could, to start us out here. Sometime around 2015, 2016, uh, I was pastoring in Pennsylvania. I uh, had been pastoring a church for, I guess, about uh, the church that I planted, started, and was pastoring there for maybe about 10 years. Um, had had lost my mother, my father, and, and several family members, and then my brother and my my wife and I were, um, you know, toying with the idea of returning to family here in Florida, and uh, we didn't know what that looked like in God's plan. Um, we were wrestling with being middle-aged and, you know, church planting again, or do we want to, you know, go to an existing church? And in the course of that, I had two churches um, their pastoral search committees had reached out to me and uh, asked me if I would be interested in being considered for their senior pastor positions. At the time, they were without a pastor, and um, it was an extremely frustrating process because they had approached me, they had asked me if I would be interested in being their senior pastor, and yet they, their pastoral search committees were left me wanting because of the way they handled themselves. <laughs> they were, um, oftentimes they would leave questions unanswered. They would uh, not return phone calls. Uh, they had made promises that were unfulfilled. And in the course of all that, I kind of realized that these aren't really churches that I want to be a part of. Um, but during that time, it also reminded me talking to these churches who had no shepherd leader at the time, and basically their pastoral search committees were sort of, and deacons were running the church. Um, I was also reminded why churches need pastors, why they need overseers. Uh, since then, each of those churches has called senior pastors and each of those churches has seen those senior pastors leave. Um, so uh, I guess a good choice on my part uh, to be here instead of there. Um, but um, the, the text that we're going to read today, we see Paul takes great effort to emphasize to Timothy how leaders should be handled um, in the good and in the difficult times of the church. This church loves really well. Like this church handles their leaders and in particular me really well um, and handles each other well. Uh, so the message that I'm giving you today, it's weird. Months, and I usually plan my sermons, uh, I'll outline a, a book of the Bible months and months in advance. And I'll work out my schedule of preaching months and months in advance. So when I found out that y'all were doing Pastor Appreciation Sunday this Sunday, and that this is the message that I was doing I felt like, oh my goodness, they're going to think this is a self-aggrandizement uh, extreme, and it's not. Um, nor is it a rebuke of this church, because this church does these things really well. I just want to say that. They, like, um, but it's, it's where we're at in the scripture, and I think it's important for the future that we understand why we are who we are and why it's important that we um, handle leaders well in the good times and in the bad. Um, because in it, in the text today, we'll find precautions and we'll find good doctrine. We, we, we don't want to do things as a church because we feel like we should do them. Uh, or we're emotionally driven to do things. We want to do things because... The scripture prescribes for us to do things a certain way. Um, the, the, the scriptures are always right. Our opinions are not. So let's read together and then we'll pray. But let's read together 1 Timothy chapter 5, 
beginning in verse 17, as Paul continues to give advice to Timothy on the the organization of these churches in Ephesus. Paul says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourselves, keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Why are y'all laughing? I guess guess y'all aren't Baptists. That's not even a point in my sermon today, by the way. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Lord, we come to your text today, and we desire to be a church that that does things well. We desire to be a church that leads well. We desire to be a church that loves well. Uh, But we want to do all these things according to your word and not according to our preferences. Lord, I've asked that you just... um, Lead us in your time, in this time, in your word. Show us how we can uh, model Christ better as a body of believers, even with regard to how we handle our elders and our overseers and our leaders and our pastors. Um, so teach us today, Father, according to your spirit, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. How should the church handle its leaders? I think Paul gives us a few pointers here on how to do that. Uh, And one of those things you're doing already today. Um, And that's the first point here. In, In verses 17 and 18, Paul says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages is 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 paul saying that that pastors are the same as as farm animals uh, that they need to be treated like farm animals i know some pastors that have not been treated that well uh but i also know churches that understand this scripture verse for what it is and they've adopted their pastor leader and they've done this really well so what is Paul saying here as far as honor, double honor, oxen, grain, wages, what is he talking about? Well, the first thing I want you to notice is this, and this is point one. Leaders should be recognized with honor. Leaders should be recognized with honor. We, Again, not self-aggrandizement here, but we, there used to be a time where, uh, Men who studied the scriptures, men who went to seminary, men who were called to pastoral ministry were respected. Not just in the church, but in the community. They were some of the most respected people. Um, I don't know what's happened. Part of it might be the pastor's fault. Uh, But whatever is going on, we just don't see that as much anymore. And I, I think... Even pastors, most pastors would would get up and feel uncomfortable sharing this text. I'm a little uncomfortable sharing the text. Nobody wants to stand up in front of a bunch of people and say, honor me. Um, But it kind of looks that way today. But I also want to highlight that this is conditional. I don't know if you noticed this, but the honor is conditional. Really two big conditions here. Who's worthy of honor? Well, 
one who Paul says oversees well, oversees well, Paulstimai. It, it means kind of rules or guides or directs, the person who, who tends the flock well. That's one condition. And it, I'm going to step on a bully pulpit here for a second. The, it used to be that pastors were satisfied tending flocks, like they were satisfied just shepherding the people that God had given them. And, um, now we've moved into, I fear, this sort of CEO mentality of pastoring where uh, the goal of a pastor is to grow his church so big so that he doesn't really have to deal in the affairs of individuals in his church. Um, and again, this isn't a slam on big churches. I feel like you can shepherd a large church as a team of pastors, but I don't think it gives any particular pastor the right to stop um, overseeing well, stop tending the flock well. Postimai is the Greek word that we get the word pastor from. So Paul's saying here, those who pastor well, shepherd well, are worthy of honor. But the other condition is this. He says, especially those who preach and teach the word, right? I think his exact language is uh, um, those who labor in preaching and teaching. Labor. This is the highlight of my week is the laboring, the, the toiling. When I love when people are here at the church during the week, I, I love mixing it up with folks. I, I love when Diane and Barbara are here on Tuesday morning and we joke back and forth and go through the administrative stuff of the church. I love all of that. Um, but no offense, I think I love a little bit more the quiet times I have during the week where it's just me and the Bible and wrestling with the, the scripture for the sermon that week. Um, Paul says, especially those who preach, the word here is uh, from the word logos, which is those who give the word. And then he says, and those who teach, dadaske, which is those who instruct. So there's, there's the aspect of the pastor who preaches or gives the word of God to people, but then there's also the role of the pastor who uses the word to instruct individuals in their lives. So it's not just, it's not just a, a pulpit mentality. It's a life change mentality. You want the word of God to be able to instruct others in how to live. That, that's, that can be a challenge sometimes, especially when you know people are places in their lives where they don't want to receive that or receiving that is going to be, mean a lot of hard changes in their life. No pastor wants to be the guy that goes up to somebody and says, all right, here's what the word of God says. If you do this, it means you're going to have to change this in your life and it's going to make your life very uncomfortable. But that's what God prescribed. Um, because typically people push back against that kind of stuff. But Paul says the guys who, who toil in this, toil is, is a word that simply means works hard at, you know, works hard at it, digging, plowing at the word of God, turning it over time and time again, never tiring of um, examining it, cross-referencing it, looking at it in different languages and, and asking the question over and over again, what does this mean for God's people? And then he goes even farther. If I could, if I could make it even more awkward this morning. He says, leaders should be recognized with honor, yes, but then he throws it down. He says, double honor. Double honor. So we give our pastors respect and thanks for sure. 
Um, Paul uses the word here, honor, time. It means to apply or pay the worthy amount of somebody. Um, if I could just preach the word this morning and kind of remove myself from this. It's like, it's like when the pastor brings, the, brings his salary before the church for a vote. Um, Paul refers to this laboring and then he refers to receiving his wage from the church multiple places in the New Testament. Why does this matter? Well, now, just like back then, there was a danger in thinking that a man of God, we, like a, a, a dualistic mindset. So a man of God who um, devotes his life to leading a, a company or an organization, or a business, that man who devotes his life to doing that is worthy of receiving the highest, most decent wage possible from that company. We wouldn't disagree with that. If a Christian man in this church were to go out and, and work for a company and do God's work and work at it as hard as he can and do an excellent job, that he should get paid as much as possible for doing that job. But the flip side of that is a, a, a dangerous mentality in the church overall that says that um, the man of God who leads the church well should do so out of his abundance of love for God and receive limited or zero wage for doing his work. And I don't say that to this church because this church does well at this. But as you move forward in this church or any church that you're a part of, just remember um, that the man who preaches or teaches God's word and toils in it is worthy of his wage, is worthy of double honor if he's doing his job well. Paul addresses this by pointing to this common verse in Deuteronomy 25.4, and I won't read it to you out of Deuteronomy because it says the same thing that Paul says here, which is that um, uh, about you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out its grain. Um, so what would happen here as he treads out his grain, so they would hook oxen to a, a millstone and the oxen would walk around the, and, and they would drag the millstone and it would crush the grain, right, into flour. And so the oxen would do this and they would keep walking around. The, the beast of burden would keep walking around. Well, what, what normally they would do is that if they didn't want the animal to eat the food while they were doing it, they would put a muzzle on them so that they couldn't eat. But what Paul says here is, if these oxen are working hard enough and the, the grain, the fruit of their labor is right there, don't muzzle the oxen so that as they do the work, if they wanna, if they wanna dip their mouth and eat of the grain while they do their work, they should be allowed to do that. So he's saying, in light of the, Pastor, teacher, don't muzzle. Allow him to make his living from the work that he's doing in the church. We shy away from these conversations. It should not be something we shy away from. This is just part of the ministry that God has put together. This is just the organization that he's put together called the church. Paul clarifies what this means in 1 Corinthians 9. He says this, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? 
The church doesn't need to apologize or feel bad for paying its pastor. Uh, it's part of God's plan. Um, Paul communicates in his writings that um, in other places, while it was right as a preacher for Paul to deny taking wages from the church, that was his right if he did not want to take a wage from the church. But it's never the right of the church to deny a wage to the preacher. So the preacher can deny the wage, but the church cannot deny paying the wage. Unless there be fear that your pastor be doing their job simply because they want to get rich or because they love money. This should have already been dealt with. If you remember, we talked about this text already earlier in 1 Timothy 3. When you call the right man according to his qualifications, one of those qualifications in 1 Timothy 3.3 3 is this that he not be a drunkard, that he not be violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. So there's this balance here that's going on. The man that the church calls, one of his qualifications is that he not be a lover of money. But the church also appreciates the work that the pastor, preacher, teacher does, and they pay him a fair wage worthy of double does this make sense? I know it's a, a, an awkward conversation to have, but it's in the scripture and it's, it's the way God laid things out. Um, so it's, it's fair game this morning. Um, I don't know any pastors, honestly, maybe it's just indicative of who I run with, but I don't know any pastors who do what they do to be rich. I, I've not met any, um, but they... I do know a bunch of guys who want to be able to care for and provide for their families. They want to be able to love their families. They like to be able to go away from time to time with their wife or their children and relax. Um, they like to get a, a decent car every now and then. Remember the first time I, was, I didn't fully understand this and I was new in ministry, I was an intern. And uh, Mindy was making a good wage, and we needed a new car. So we got a decent car. I wasn't making very much money, but we didn't have any children at the time, so we thought we could still get a decent car. Kids took away all that money. Um, so then we reverted to beaters for a while. But uh, at the time, we thought, well, we can get a decent car. And I can remember the first time this came up, we were at a car dealership here in Sarasota, and... Uh, there were two cars that we were choosing from, and one had leather interior and one had fabric interior. And Mindy said to me, is a pastor allowed to have a car with leather interior? So we got the car with fabric. Um, and I, I, to this day, I look back on that, and I'm like, ah, oh, the innocence of that question at the time. Um, now I would have gotten a leather interior, especially <laughs> knowing that I was going to have small children. And uh, leather cleans up a lot easier than, than fabric, right? So um, when, you, when your kid throws their juice box on the, on the it, it's, it's a lot easier with leather than it is with fabric. Um, but yeah, a lot of guys in pastoral ministry, they just, they just want to be able to make an honest living, provide for their family, maybe save a few dollars for retirement or whatever, and um, not get rich. They just don't want to have to rely on the government for handouts. I know that they, I've, I've had a lot of friends, um, I shouldn't say a lot, but several friends that I've known that have, uh, they've been serving in churches that wanted to keep them humble. And one of the ways they did this was through their pay package. And then they would, so they would get paid. And then after they, the grocery money ran out, they went to the food bank. Um, if your pastor is going to the food bank, you're not doing it well. Um, so, how should we? How should the church handle its leaders? Leaders should be recognized with honor. Second thing Paul says here is this: leaders should be judged fairly. 
You want to handle your leaders correctly. Leaders should be judged fairly. Um, this is sort of ver beginning of verse 19, just to refresh your memory. He says, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. What's Paul talking about here? Well, uh, the, the church has a, a biblical system in place uh, for dealing with conflict and discipline that needs to occur in the lives of in individuals. And the elder pastor is part of that body. There may be, I pray never, but there may be a time where you're in a church and the pastor has committed a sin that requires being dealt with. How do you do that? Well, you deal with it the same way that you deal with anybody else who is in a situation of unrepentant sin in their life. Uh, Jesus gave us the system. Jesus gave us the method. In Matthew 18, he said this beginning in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Remember, Paul said that in his text to Timothy. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Remember, Paul said that in his text. He said, take it before everyone. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What does that mean? Treated as an unbeliever. Treated as an unbeliever. So, like with anyone else, personal discussion and reconciliation is key in the beginning. Why go to, if the elder or leader or pastor is in sin, if you think they're in sin, why go to them alone? Uh, because, the goal in a church is not to drop bombs. Like it's, it's not to blow the whole organization up for the sake of making a point. If you know that somebody is in sin, go to them alone first and talk to them about it. Who knows? Maybe that individual will be like, oh my gosh, I was never even thinking about it that way. Or yeah, I knew I'd been doing that and I need to confess that and repent of it. Can I, can I confess and repent to you? And you may win your brother back in that simple act of personal um, confrontation, reconciliation. Um, but he says, if that doesn't work, then what you need to do is take two or three other witnesses. What's a witness? Somebody who can attest to the fact that this is going on and that the pastor leader is unrepentant of it, right? This isn't allies. You're not... This isn't, again, trying to blow up the church where you say, who will see it my way? How can we get this pastor out of here? Who can I rally to my cause? These are true witnesses who recognize that what the person is doing is a sin and needs to be dealt with. And they need to hear that the pastor leader is unrepentant of what they're doing. That's the two or three witnesses. Sadly, what, what happens often is because the man is the pastor, he's blindsided in a meeting or he's, quote, informed in a group text message or email. Folks in the church have been talking about it for weeks without him ever knowing about it. He shows up at a meeting and there's a whole slew of people who are ready to throw a millstone around his neck and drown it. Um, that's not the biblical way that this is dealt with. Here's why it matters, especially with regard to an elder or a pastor. The reputation and livelihood of an elder is a precious 
thing that demands proper handling. The pastor's reputation is precious and demands proper handling. And here's why it's precious. Because it is tied intricately with the reputation of the church that he pastors. You want to be very cautious and careful in how you deal with a pastor who may or may not be in the midst of sin because the way you deal with it is going to speak volumes to the public at large that is watching the church. How many times have we seen a pastor uh, struggle in a moral failure and the church handle it the wrong way and couple years later, that church is either barely existing or falling off the map. And a church that is bent on taking, um, taking out a pastor without proper handling forgets how closely tied these things are. You just blow things up without even thinking about it. And then lastly, he says... Um, Rebuke them and, and those who persist in sin. So if an individual goes to the leader, no repentance. And then two or three witnesses go, no repentance. They continue to persist in the sin. It says then, um, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. The presence of all. Remember, Jesus said it needs to be brought to the church. Should leaders continue in, un, in proven, unrepentant sin, it needs to be brought before all. This is not a matter of public humiliation. This is a matter of redemption and reconciliation. The overall goal of church discipline, whether it's your pastor leader or just a random member of the church, the overall objective of church discipline is redemption and restoration, not punishment. So the object is to see your pastor, leader, or anybody else in the church made right with God and made right with the body. Verse 21, he gives a warning here. He says, but do this without prejudging and without partiality. Now, I'm going to be honest. I wrestled with this one for a long time this week, trying to you know, get at the heart of what God was really saying here. And there's a, I think there's a great warning in this, especially with how we deal with leaders. Leaders are lightning rods for decision-making. Sometimes they make decisions that they don't want to have to make. Sometimes pastors have to make decisions that they know are going to hurt somebody's feelings. Sometimes they have to make decisions that everybody's going to cheer. But people are always going to have their opinions about the decisions that leaders make. When Paul says, when dealing with the sin of a pastor, do it without partiality and do it without prejudging. There's always going to be that potential danger of bringing your opinions into the matter at hand of dealing with the pastor's or leader's sin. You know what I'm saying? Like, the pastor decided a year ago that we were, we were not going to do this particular outreach event anymore. And that was my favorite outreach event. And I'm really upset about that. So now... I see an opportunity to grind my axe in this situation. I'm bringing my partiality into a situation that doesn't really warrant it. These are hard truths. There's stuff that we don't talk about in church ever, really. But if we did more of this, I think our churches would be healthier in the long run if we were honest about these kind of requirements. Don't allow your feelings and your prejudices to drive the church discipline. And the third and last thing I think here this morning 
on how to handle church leaders. And this is vitally important. At the end of his, his text for today, at the end of chapter 5, Paul says um, uh, in verse 22, Do not be hasty in laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. And then he says about a little side note here, a little personal commentary to Timothy, who apparently had not been feeling well. And he told him to maybe Paul thought his sickness was coming from bad water. So he said, drink some wine uh, if your stomach is bothering you. Those of you who have been to third world countries and drank the water, you understand what we're talking about. Um, Verse 24, the sins of some people are conspicuous going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. So here's the last thing about handling leaders. Point three. Leaders should be appointed carefully. Leaders should be appointed carefully. Not hastily, not without testing. Leaders should be appointed carefully. If we've seen anything in Paul's letters here regarding leaders, it's that behavior and reputation matter a lot. The behavior and reputation of your pastor matter a lot. Also, qualifications matter. The easiest way to avoid regret later on with regard to a pastor or a leader in the church, whether it be through... um, their love of money or their sinful behavior. The easiest remedy to that is found in a church taking its time, disciplining itself in selecting leadership. Who do you call to be a pastor? Do you know um, that it's the church, the local church, that ordains a man for ministry? There's no... Um, there's no hierarchical structure in the scripture that says that there's a um, a presbytery or a, a pope that chooses who does what. In scripture, it's always the local believers who ordain and choose who will be the man of God to shepherd and pastor. So do it well. Be picky. That way you don't run into these problems later on. And if that man, for whatever reason, life or God carries him away from your congregation to another congregation, you can feel good about the fact that the next people are getting a good pastor. And that we know what we need in order to call our next good pastor. Or maybe they come up from within the congregation like it used to be in in, biblical times. So he says here, uh, be slow in laying on of hands, laying on of hands. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, this was a symbol of setting someone apart for the purpose of ministry in Christ. In in Numbers 27, 18, in the Old Testament, uh, so the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit and lay your hand on him. Now, when my dad said to me when I was younger that he was going to lay a hand on me, it meant something different than what God meant here. Um, and I'm thankful it did not happen that often. Well, it did happen. But with this purpose, it was Joshua's to be the next leader of Israel. And it was recognized, God affirmed the fact that the Spirit of God was upon him. So what God wanted Moses to do was to lay hand on him, which also usually involves prayer. Um, And then in Acts chapter 6, when they called the first deacon, and what they said pleased the whole gathering in verses 5 and 6, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, there it is again, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. 
These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. As leadership is appointed, the laying on of hands is the recognition from the church to that individual that you are called by God to this position, this role, this leadership. Um, we're going to have an opportunity to do that as a church here very soon. Uh, in just a couple weeks, uh, Didier will be sitting for an um, uh, ordination council uh, where our, uh, myself and our elder George and uh, Pastor Eric Wants and uh, another pastor here in Sarasota are going to sit down and we're going to question Didier and we're going to ask him about his beliefs and his qualifications and uh, should he pass that, which I fully believe he will, um, then this church, the, the ordination council will make a recommendation to this church that we ordain Didier as a pastor. And then we'll have a special service. And I haven't decided if we do it on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening, but we'll have a special service where the whole purpose will be to encourage Didier and Mayulis and Diana and that we will lay hands on them and that we as a church will pray over them and, uh, and practice ordination of him for the ministry that God has said. Doesn't that sound cool? I mean, like, that's going to be a great time. But we want to make sure we have the right man, the good man, which I think most of us would agree we already kind of see that. Um, we've seen his yes. Amen. So allow the time and opportunity to flesh out. He says, don't do it quickly. Allow time and opportunity to flesh out the qualifications of a young believer or someone new to the congregation. And then he says about, you know, what's conspicuous and what's not conspicuous. This is why time matters, right? So like with Didier, you, we've seen him for a, an extended period of time, you more than me, but you've seen him for an extended period of time. You've seen his commitment to the Lord and his faithfulness and his integrity and his qualifications and his love for his family and the way he handles himself and his his business and his money and all those sorts of things are important and we can then say with we've taken time and you can now say with 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 great assurance yes god is upon this man and god has called this man and we're going to pray for him and affirm him in that that's what Paul was telling Timothy to do as he appointed leaders in Ephesus. If we want to prevent troubles later on, make sure we get the right guy in the beginning. A little bit of work in the beginning can save a lot of headache later on. Um, so when we looked back in 1 Timothy 3, and we saw all those qualifications for a pastor, and we thought to ourselves, man, that's a lot. Who would possibly want that job? Who could do that? Well, I think the, the right answer, the honest question is, nobody really in their own rightful heart and mind could do the job. But if the Spirit is upon the right man and his life is indicative of faith in Christ and, and, and moral integrity in Christ, uh, you can be sure that you have the right man. And though he not be perfect, as I am not, for sure, um, that... Uh, we take comfort in the fact that you, you know that the trajectory of that man is God's plan and God's purpose for your church. Um, and nothing but good will come of that. Let's pray together.